This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder and CEO of Wealth Ability. And uh, today we have a very special guest. And we're talking about a very interesting, I think, critical subject about China and our supply chain with China and how it affects our personal economy, not just how it affects the broader economy. Um, we'll talk about that, but what can we actually do? So here's what we're gonna learn today. Today, how do we deal with some kind of interruption or how do we make sure that whatever interruption there is with China, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's an economic crisis or a trade war or something else, how do we make sure that doesn't impact significantly our personal economy? So we have a, an expert on, uh, on China and we have Brian Miller with us and Brian, it is great to have you. Thanks for having me on the show. So Brian, uh, tell, just if you will, just give us 30 seconds about yourself. I know you've got an extensive background in manufacturing, but right now you're, you're in the logistics game. And give us a little bit of uh, what do you do and, and, and why are you in China? <laughs> yeah, sure. Just really quickly. So I'm a native of Connecticut originally, um, and I've been in China for the last 10 years. Uh, I used to work in manufacturing, and now I uh, founded uh, a company called Easy China Warehouse. And what we do is we basically help e-commerce companies that make products in China uh, to distribute them from China uh, all around the world to their customers. And we are located in Shenzhen, China, which is a southern city that borders Hong Kong. And um, that's where we are basically on the map. That's, uh, that's awesome. That's, that's fascinating. Um, we actually have a lot of our listeners are e-commerce people. So... Okay. I mean, a lot, and they're, and they're manufacturing in China. So this is a really big topic for them. And I know they're going to love to hear uh, your feedback on this. So uh, first question for you is how concerned are you, you know, you're seeing it from the other side. So how concerned should we be about the supply chain interruption? We, we felt that with, uh, of course, the N95 masks, um, that supply chain interruption here in the U.S., that was the most obvious in the media um, but I know that there's been a lot of different supply chain interruptions in the last few years. How concerned should we be about that? Yeah, I think overall now there should be less concern than it was before. Um, when we started with the pandemic, there basically wasn't enough manufacturing capacity to make all of the uh, equipment that we needed for our medical workers. And it still does seem to be that we're a little bit light on the amount of uh, medical equipment that we have for people in the U.S. However, the the uh, supply chain is starting to rebound and kind of market forces are starting to take place where supply and demand. So there's a large supply and there's been an addition of factories that have come online and they've increased their capacity in China. And also at the same time, um, people have been able to put more product on container ships uh, to the U.S. and make it kind of more affordable uh, to purchase a lot of the equipment as well. So it's getting back to normal. I hear at least from some of my friends in the U.S. that it's not perfect, but we're starting to get better capacity uh, from China, at least uh, for this type of equipment. Okay, so let's say um, we have e-commerce people to sell anything from umbrellas to um uh, you know, any type of uh, anything that's sold on Amazon, we've probably got it in our, in our listeners and our network. So um, if, how, how concerned should we be about that interruption? Because all of that's coming from China, all of our manufacturing, if we're in e-commerce, a lot of it, almost all of it's coming from China. How do, how do we make sure that that doesn't get interrupted? Yeah, so I think this has been a big question for everyone during the whole trade war. And now that the virus has become a global issue. And I think since the virus has spread around the world, the relations between China and the US have gotten worse uh, and not better since since the, the, the trade war, right? So they kind of escalated worse and worse and worse. And then we've gotten from the trade war definitely significantly worse from where we are uh, before. Um, and I think it's something that people should be concerned about as far as manufacturing here, like manufacturing is more or less online. So let's say capacity for companies that need to buy things from China is okay. 
And the virus is relatively uh, stabilized in China, meaning that they've been able to really control the spread uh, amongst the population. And so we've seen like manufacturing from uh, February where we had the you know, the the peak of the virus within China, where almost nothing was happening. To March, you know, 50% or more of the production capacity came on. And then in April, we saw 80 to 90, 80 to 100% back online. So from now on, we've seen that the production capacity is here. I think the pe- thing that people concerned should be concerned about is just the relations between the US and China, and whether that will affect our ability to purchase product from China. Um, so that's what I think people should be concerned about now. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask you the question. I, I know you're not a policy guy necessarily, <laughs> but if you, you're if you're emperor, what would you do? Yeah, so what I think we be doing. What should we be doing with China? Yeah, so <laughs> this is a great question because I'm very invested in China, so I want people to buy more from China, right? Um, because we help people ship from China. But I would say overall, over the past you know, five to 10 years, lower end manufacturing or low value manufacturing has already started to leave China. So that means things like textiles, shoes, um, anything that has like a very low technology, high labor requirement to make the product has moved to other places in Southeast Asia, India, Bangladesh. And so we've already seen that trend happening. Um, I think that um, it's hard to move the more uh, high, you know, mid to high tech type products away from China because China has such a strong supply chain. And by strong, I mean that um, when you make something, there's various tiers of supply chains. You have a, you know, raw material and then you have a component and then the component gets assembled into the final product. And China basically clusters those factories around each other and they're able to really efficiently make product. Whereas other places around the world don't have the efficiency that China has and the infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean not only online infrastructure, so like Alibaba that people know, where you can find factories where you can go online and, 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 and search them easily, but also physical uh, you know, infrastructure. That means the roads, the ports, the ports, the efficiency of the ports, all those things are very um, efficient. And even though China's, um, let's say, labor cost has gone up, they've been able to stay competitive compared to other countries, like lower cost countries, because of all the strong infrastructure that they've built over the years. So if I were a buyer of, of China, I would say that China is still going to be a strong uh, manufacturer in the world. Uh, into the future, kind of because we don't have another choice. <laughs> and I don't think that manufacturing will move from China back to the U.S. If it does leave China, it will probably move to another low-cost country, just because that's not the way the U.S. is set up to kind of uh, the system, basically, right? So I, I'm curious, how does China view the U.S.? Um, I would say <laughs> it's interesting now, like... Um, I would say it's an important market for China. So uh, in, in terms of export market, it's a very important market where, where China makes and sells a lot of goods to the U.S. Um, I would say that there definitely is tensions uh, growing globally. Uh, you could say that kind of nationalism has, has been very popular, whether it be in the U.S. or in Europe okay. uh, and also in China, everywhere, regardless of which side you, you, you are politically. Um, and I think that's built some tension within the society. Uh, between China and the U.S., but they still view the U.S. as an important market for them to export to. And I don't think the Chinese want to really break that business relationship that they built over many, many years, despite the differences that both sides have. So do you see, um, I mean, you mentioned that um, uh, you're seeing the low-tech stuff move out of China already. Are you seeing that, I mean, just on a regular basis that uh, and, and is that is the the level of tech is it creeping up so that um, you know higher higher and higher tech is leaving China and going somewhere else? Yeah, like we've we've seen um, actually w- we tend to see that China starts is has been winning higher tech manufacturing. Um, so anything that maybe let's let's say the Germans were always very good at engineering and building cars, right. And building components and things like that. And um, they kind of had a very strong core competency in those components, but we're seeing over time that China's uh, 
capability in in terms of uh, manufacturing technology has improved so much that they're able to kind of win some of that business away. So I would say on the high end of manufacturing, China's winning business and on the low end, they're losing. So they're losing it to other lower cost fa- uh, countries. Got it. So uh, tell us what's, um, what's the impact, what's Tesla's impact going to be in China? As they, as they, as they add, are they adding factories? Are they going to continue to increase their, uh, their, their presence in China? Yeah, I think overall, at least, um, at least Elon Musk has been very kind of friendly with the Chinese and they've built a factory in an incredible amount of time within China. And also the car within China is well-respected. I mean, people think highly of the Tesla product and consumers overall respect the product and will pay more for it. So I think overall in the Chinese market, it will be a good um, uh, kind of product that people will buy along with all of the incentives that the government has been given. So a lot of people don't know that um, you know, the Chinese government has given tons of incentives to promote uh, green technology, even though they're always notoriously known as kind of a bad actor in terms of environment. Yeah. Um, but at least where I live, all of our buses are electric. All of the taxis are electric. Um, if you don't want to wait, so they have a waiting line for a license plate, meaning that they want to limit the amount of cars on the road. And in order to jump that line, if you buy an electric car, you get your license plate right away. So they've created a lot of incentives and also all uh, light truck in Shenzhen, where I live, needs to be electric by, I believe, this year or next year. So you see a very strong um, government regulation presence to kind of push this technology. And I think not just in Shenzhen, but all over China. Um, they're pushing, you know, greener cars. And so Tesla is definitely going to be a beneficiary of this type of regulation for sure. Interesting. So um, shifting back a little bit to the the pandemic. So um, what's, what's been the impact in China on uh, the, you know, the, the uptick in cases in the U S and around the world? I mean, how does, I, I know China has been able to very successfully, you know, they have a particular society that allows for this, I think, to mm-hmm. um, control yeah. a virus like that, an outbreak like that. And that's one part, that's the supply side. But on the, on the consumption side, um, how, is, how is China, how has it affected China for our consumption? Because our consumption has gone way down. Yeah. So how, how has that affected China? Yeah, so this is a <laughs> this is a really good question. Um, when the outbreak started in China, we saw basically a constraint on supply. So factories were not able to get back onto line in the begin, you know, in the beginning of the year, uh, right after Chinese New Year, which was in February. And so buyers were kind of hungry to kind of get products as the virus was not really uh, spreading in their countries, right? And after the Chinese factories got online around March and April, we saw like a very strong spread around the world. And this is where we saw kind of demand drop off as far as, um, you know, buyers willing to make orders at the factories. Um, But one thing important to note, even though I'd say that there is demand that's gone down and a lot of factories have actually closed or gone on extended vacation because they don't have orders. They basically put up a sign that said, hey, we're closed for three months on vacation. So we're seeing the effects. But at the same time, when the U.S. government uh, provided stimulus in terms of uh, unemployment benefits Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the checks that went out and the Fed buying a lot of let's see, jumping into the market, which we haven't seen ever, which, right? Um, Once this happened, actually, we saw a very strong uptick in our volume as an e-commerce shipper. So our business tripled actually during that time. And we think it was because a lot of people were sitting home without work, but they were getting checks from the government. And so what do you do when you're ordering online? Nothing to do. Exactly. (laughs) You're you're buying stuff online. And and so we saw a massive uptick. No no kidding. My five-year-old granddaughter has learned how to shop online and actually has a, has a play date with my wife today to uh, do some online shopping. Yeah. So this is what we saw is, is, is free money came out and, and Americans do what they do best, which is they spend it. Right. Right. And so 
And so we saw a very strong uptick. We saw factories kind of jump on board and grab all of these, these orders from people that were buying things. And we didn't, I mean, for our business, because we focus only on e-commerce, it was heavily concentrated in e-commerce, obviously. Like retail is taking a beating now, right? But, right. but um, yeah, there is a softness in the amount of demand around the world for sure. But we did see that it kind of be uh, lightened a bit from the money that was provided from the government. So basically what you saw is that that injection into the economy, because there's always a question, well, you know, if the government injects money in the economy, does it actually... Uh, if, if if the government gives helicopter money to the people, does it get immediately into the economy? And what you're saying is yes. If it's in the hands, it depends on whose hands it's in, right? right. Because I, the I was reading an article this morning that the um, that the the top 25 percent of income earners has actually decreased their spending, um, where the yeah. bottom 75 percent has increased their spending. So here's a here's a question for you. So July 31st, unemployment runs out. That six hundred dollars a week, which I'm sure has been fueling a lot of this, right? That six hundred dollars yep. a week. Uh, you got forty million people getting six hundred an, an extra six hundred dollars a week. That runs out, okay. And people are still in many parts of the country, um, not in Arizona, but apparently, um, but in many where I am, but in many parts of the country, they're still concerned about going to restaurants. They're still concerned about going out. Um, because not everybody's wearing masks and masks aren't required and et, et cetera, et cetera. So if that's the case, okay, and, the, and, and, the, and Congress does not extend that or they reduce it substantially, what kind of impact does that have uh, uh, on your business basically and on what's going on with e-commerce with China? Yeah, I think overall net, net, um, for e-commerce, uh, the coronavirus is actually going to be a positive for us. So um, it's forced people to go online and purchase. It's forced people that have never bought online to sign up for an account and to buy things. It's forced people that have never bought, let's say, groceries online to start doing that. And once you create those habits and consumers, they keep doing it. And so, so for people in e-commerce, I think actually... Uh, COVID-19 has actually accelerated the trend that we were already seeing in e-commerce, which is growth um, in the sector. And it's kind of pushed it forward a bit faster. Um, overall, for the for the economy, I mean, I'm not an economist, but um, I think it's well, not going to be You're on the front good. lines of the economy. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do think that um, it's in the current administration's uh, own interest to continue uh, giving money to people until the election, of course. And so I wouldn't put it past the fact that they might um, pass other stimulus measures in the future. And if they do, then we might, you know, let's say be okay on the surface for a while. Uh, if we don't, then I think it will hurt um, uh, more companies that are in retail as opposed to e-commerce. So I think e-commerce will be, not to say that it won't be unscathed if there's no more stimulus, but it will perform much better than any other types of, of, of sales methods, let's say, in the market. So, so you think that um, the buying habits, and now that people start buying online, they're going to continue to buy online. So that's, that's a shift in how people are going to consume, and you think that's a permanent shift? Yeah, I think it's permanent. And I think, um, uh, let's say, uh, at least for a lot of the things that we never thought that we would buy online, I think we're going to start to buy online. And I think it's going to push the trend further and faster. So uh, for, for our business, our business has been very positively affected from it. Uh, the virus. Unfortunately, as, as bad as it's been for the health of populations, it's been very good for e-commerce companies. So, so, um, we've been talking a lot uh, on our podcast over the last couple of months about how you have to shift the way you do business now. So we've seen, for example, we saw restaurants in um, San Francisco who became grocery stores. Okay, they were repackaging, becoming grocery stores because then they were and those and they actually did well. We have a we ha I actually have a client um, that has a mi microbrewery and um, they just bottled all their product. And they, they actually had a drive-by window and they, and, and so they kept going because of that. Cause they couldn't have people right. come in, you know, the bar, the bar was closed, right? The restaurant was closed. Um, but they could, they could do it that way. Um, 
so what I'm hearing from you is, is that if this is a permanent shift, then perhaps one of the things we ought to be considering in every business, even service business, is that there's just going to be a lot more done online. Is that fair? Yeah, and I think how we reach our consumers is also important, not just through products, but also through sales. So, you know, maybe maybe after this time we might realize, oh, we don't we don't really need to travel on a plane anymore, or we or we can't for a long time to do a sales call, right? We can't meet in person, and so that's what we saw in China, at least after the virus started becoming a bit better. People still didn't travel for business, so we started doing you know everyone's doing Zoom calls, but but maybe you know, we'll have more of a digital approach to even our sales methods as businesses uh, going into the future for sure. Interesting. So we, I mean, for example, um, we've had, uh, we do, we run seminars um, uh, several times a year and yeah. normally we would do those in person, but this year we did them on Zoom, right? And as we actually, it doubled our attendance. So it, it's just so much less expensive and people are right. finding, it seems like, and you tell me what you think, it seems like people are finding out it's not that bad. So there are, we actually did a, a survey after our first event and said, you know, should we continue in the future? Let's say you can travel. Do you want to travel? And right. it was about 50-50. Okay, 50% 50 said, you know what, there are things you get when you're in person that you don't get, uh, you know, over a, over a video conference, which is absolutely true. Right. But because uh, there's interaction, you can get with an instructor that you can't get right in right. a, in a, in a video conference. He said, but on the other hand, you know, you save a day on both sides, right? Both sides of the seminar. If you're going to three day seminar, you lose a day traveling there and you lose a day traveling back. And right. so you don't lose that time. You don't lose that money and you can do a lot more. And it's just been fascinating to me to watch that. And I've seen it over and over again. And what I've seen is just like you is I've seen the people who are, um, really adjusting to this online, uh, it's, it's almost like the <laughs> pandemic just accelerated what was already going, what, what was always going to happen. But it yeah. seems like it accelerated by maybe three or four or five years even. And, and now all of a sudden everybody had to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly a um, millennial. Right. So, so my generation, the baby boomers, um, hey, boomer, um, we, you know, we've been notorious for not, you know, adopting um, the Internet and computers and so forth as fast as, say, you know, the millennials have. And so now we're forced to. So, you know, we're ordering online because my wife and I are actually both highly susceptible to this virus. So we don't go out. We, you know, uh, Instacart is like they like own a, <laughs> we, we should own shares. You should right? buy, yeah. <laughs> we should absolutely buy shares in Instacart because we're funding, um, you know, a third of their economy um, just in our household. Um, but it seems sometimes, but uh, on the, so, so that's a shift. And um, so, um, you know, as, as we think about the future, okay, as we think about what's going to happen and, and how to protect ourselves, what are some things you think that either, either, individual uh, businesses could do, entrepreneurs could do. What, do you th what are some things we can do to protect ourselves either from supply chain interruptions or from, you know, this whole shift in how people buy? Yeah, I'm going to first go on kind of your point that you've talked right now, which is I think everyone needs to become more savvy, at least in internet marketing. So that means, you know, take a course um, online. There's plenty of courses. Learn from your friends. Um, I think the people that are not savvy enough about how to in market on the internet will be left behind. Um, and it will be harder and harder for those people to market their products and services to everyone. So that's the first thing. Like, And I think luckily as young people like me and probably a lot of the listeners, we have an advantage, right? Because we've kind of grown up with, with sure. using the internet and being, being accustomed uh, very to it. Natural and, and, and it's mm -hmm. Very natural for you. It's very natural, right? And so, so especially for, you know, older listeners on the show, definitely like brush up on your skills and know that this is an important, you know, thing that is taking the world uh, by trend for sure. Well, and it's um, nice because we have a, we actually have, there's more people online, right? So right. It, the market's actually gotten a lot bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I'd say as far as like supply chain, um, it's always important to diversify your supply chain, whether you um, manufacture in China, you know, you should have two factories always if you can. Um, you should try to keep safety stock 
in a local U.S. warehouse or a warehouse uh, that's in the country that you do business in um, so that you have some extra cushion. Um, I think these are important in terms of just keeping uh, safe as far as your business. And you might need to think about in the future, you know, do I try to find a factory outside of China or do I find a local U.S. factory that can produce 20 percent of my uh, overall demand and 80 percent is made in, in China, right? And so you're probably going to pay more for that 20%, but that security might offer some value, you know, in the future if there is some type of disruption. A little insurance. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And we, we always recommend that. And it might be something that people consider um, as tensions get worse, as, you know, there are these types of global pandemics that I'm not saying they're normal, but it could happen again, right? At some yeah. time with something else. And so it's something that we all need to think about like going forward and it's a good wake up call, right? Like yeah, <laughs> this is sure. something that's kind of like, right. you know, so wake up. smacked us in the face and now we're able to kind of uh, think about the risks in our businesses and the risks in our lives and how to adjust for those. Right. Well, that's the concern I have for um, the 40 million people who lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Right? right. I mean that you have a pandemic come, you lose your job. Are you going to continue and go back to that? and try to have do the same old, same old. And when, you know, the world maybe has moved beyond that. And, you know, to me, this is a, you know, you talk about e-commerce and going, there's never been a better t time to start a business as right sure. now, because you have such a much bigger market because you have old people like me that are actually online <laughs> buying things, right? And we're buying them with our granddaughters and, and, and we are consuming online that we didn't used to do that. And so now we have to find it too. So that's part of the, the um, e-commerce marketing, the online marketing is how do, how do people find you? How do people find your product? You know, I mean, it's one thing if you're, you know, number one on Amazon, um, you, they're going to find you. But if you're not, how do people find you? And right. how, do, how do you make sure that, that you know, they can, they, they've got good product reviews and, and uh, you know, all of those basic, really fundamentals of uh, online marketing. So, um, any final words? Uh, final words, uh, Brian. Tell us. Uh, tell us how to how to find you. I mean, because w we do have your customers are listening. So where would we find you? <laughs> yeah. So if anyone wants to learn more about us, you can go to our website. It's easychinawarehouse.com. Um, and if you want to get in contact with me, whether it's to inquire about our services or to learn anything about China, I love talking about China. You can send me an email at Brian at easychinawarehouse.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, remember that, you know, when, when we, when we can adapt to things like a pandemic, I mean, to me, this is a great opportunity, a great lesson in adapting, innovating, um, you know, pivoting in our business. And when we do that, we're always going to make way more money and pay way less taxes. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.